take a seat. I didn't have an opportunity to uh, welcome all of you, but I want to say thank you for being here this evening. One of the things that we're trying to do is to create an opportunity for some conversation. So if there's just a couple of you at a table, if you would be willing to kind of go and fill in so we have full tables so we can have, um, you know, all more people participating in the conversation, I would appreciate that. All right, with that, Erica, would you please call roll, and I'll call this meeting to order, our special meeting on September 18th, 2019. Here. Here. All right, thank you. So again, I want to say thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, one of the things that we have heard is that sometimes people are a little uncomfortable um, speaking in council chambers. So we wanted to try um, something a little different. So we are hoping that you will all work with us on that. And we're trying to create a bit of an, of an environment that feels safe and respectful to everyone that's here. So our purpose of the meeting tonight is to um, present to you the six criteria that we are using for the Indian, Indian and Buttles Road um, Corridor Study. And our outcome, our desired outcome is to hear from you, um, or it's for you to hear the criteria that we're considering, and that would hopefully explain the why behind this. And we want to have, when we leave here, feedback from you on what your thoughts are, and to hear if there's anything else that we should be considering um, other than this criteria so we can make an informed decision. So let me just explain to you what our process looks like because it's a little different than our regular process. So our staff will, you should have some agendas on your table. So the staff will be doing um, presentations and they'll do it um, two criteria at a time. And then at your table, we're going to ask that you choose a recorder and a spokesperson for your table. And then we want you to discuss what you've heard, and we'd like you to capture the thoughts that people have and any questions that they might have. We'll give you about seven minutes, I think, for that. There's a, I think Grant has a slide with that on it. Um, after that, We'll go back then to the next two criteria, and we'll repeat the process until we get through all six criteria. Once that is done, we're going to go around table by table, and we're going to ask your recorder or your um, spokesperson to um, report out on the major themes from your table and any questions that you had. The role of council tonight is the role that it is in any of our um, city council meetings and that is that this is truly a listening session there isn't going to be any decisions made tonight our goal is to really hear what your thoughts are so with that I am going to turn it over to mr. Marshall Grant Marshall who is our director of planning All right. thank you madam mayor and good evening everyone um, I do want to start off with just a little bit of an agenda I know the mayor just um, uh, commented on this and so again um, this is what uh, we will be going through this evening, so I won't spend too much time with this, but we'll talk about each of the criteria um, and dive deeper down into those with table discussion and then have um, individual reports at the end and then some final comments following that. Uh, so with that, uh, this evening, uh, the table discussions will follow the staff presentation, so that's the opportunity that um, all of you will be able to have to discuss uh, with the people at your table. Um, we'd ask that you to hold your questions until um, the end um, or uh, not ask questions during the presentation. Staff will be walking around the room during the discussion, so if you do have questions for one of the staff, you can easily pull us um, aside at, at one of those pieces. Uh, but we do want to be respectful of um, all of you. We want to be respectful of others that are in attendance. So we'd ask you to please conduct yourself um, civilly and then make sure that we are uh, prompt in, in time. We do want to get you out of here at 9 o'clock, so we want to continue rolling and be as efficient as possible. So with that being said, one of the things we wanted to talk about and be able to provide is just a basic overview. So I've seen a lot of faces from our walking tours, and um, that's great to see people that are still engaged in this project. 
And so a lot of this information might be a bit repetitive, but I'd ask you to, to hold in um, or hang tight with us and, and, and go forward. We do have some new um, things that we're going to be touching on as well. <clears throat> but one of the things I do want to talk about is back in 2016, really from 2015 to 2017, but called the 2016 Corridor Study. That was a study that was initiated by Michigan Department of Transportation, MDOT, and it effectively looked at an area from Washington all the way to airport, and I'll show a map here in a second. But before we talk about the study and, and the trial, we want to be able to kind of delineate those this evening. Because what we had was a corridor study that looked at that entire business route section, and now we have a nine block road diet trial um, that's being uh, conducted as a three-year assessment within that nine block area. So again, the 2016 study looked from Washington Street down Lot, Patrick and Lyons to Indian and Buttles, all the way up Eastman Road to Airport Road, and more of the discussion this evening, and, and quite frankly, what seems to be uh, more of the buzz within the community is this nine block section that we do have in the trial area that you see highlighted here. So launching into the study itself, there was six objectives. Well, actually, there were seven objectives. We've actually condensed the first two, both relating to traffic, uh, to be the first one that you see here. But the study itself had six objectives, and that was to accommodate current and anticipated future traffic within the corridor. Enhance safety for all modes of transportation, so vehicles, passenger vehicles, trucks, sugar beet trucks, um, people that are on feet or riding their bicycle, all of the users of this area. Increase neighborhood connectivity, including the neighborhoods that surround downtown, like Midtown and the Historic District, as well as area that was uh, formerly known as Discovery Square with the Center for the Arts and the City Library. To improve the non-motorized mobility, to do context-sensitive design, which is really a holistic look at a variety of objectives when you're planning for street design. And then lastly, to support the economic development all within the corridor. So a graphic that you may have seen in some of these discussions is up here on the screen, and this was right out of the study itself. There was an analysis that was done to look at preferred alternatives within the corridor itself, and looking specifically at Indian and Buttles, there was three analysis that were done and alternatives that were determined. Within the study itself and through the analysis that was done by the consulting team that MDOT had hired that it, and also public input and engagement with um, members of the public at open houses, the top one you see here is what was ultimately determined as the preferred alternative or the resulting preference of the study itself. So you can see the, uh, the one on the right is Indian, one on the left is Buttles, and going from a three-lane street down to a two-lane street with this flexible yellow space that you see here that could be used for non-motorized purposes or for some other use in the future. So now we're in to 2019, but back in 2018, there was a three-year assessment that was initiated to do a trial study on this nine block section. And that followed two, beef tri or two brief trial implementations, both in uh, 2017, one in August, next one in uh, November 2017, it also involved a public open house that was held in September 13th, uh, where members of the public were able to come and talk about um, the observations that they had at that time, following a brief um, couple day um, trial that was done on Buttles back in 2017. So we have had some frequently asked questions as it relates to the study and the trial itself. And so this evening, we did want to engage um, MDOT. And so I do have Bob Rank of the Michigan Department of Transportation I'm going to turn the mic over to right now and answer some of these frequently asked questions. Thank you. Um, I have a cold, so I'm going to try to make it through tonight. Um, my name is Bob Rank. I am the region engineer for the Michigan Department of Transportation in Bay Region. There are seven regions in the state of Michigan, and I'm one of the uh, people in charge of all the traffic, all the construction, design, maintenance, operations in a 15-county area. And my area covers from Port Huron up to Standish, over to Clara County, down to Gratiot County, including Bay City, Saginaw, Midland, Flint, Wasso, uh, all, the, all the area around the bay, including the Thumb. Um, when we have projects that are being looked at, uh, especially when we involve in the future, we typically will start having conducting some preliminary investigations, some study about what could happen in the future. Um, when it's a small burb 
like say Harrison or Alma or somewhere like that. Usually our own folks can do a study. But in this case, uh, when we have a one-way pair situation, we like to involve and get a consultant going to look at all aspects of it. So when we and, and looked at uh, what's gonna come up in the future in the next five-year plan, we, you obviously the condition out on, on the roadways are not in that great a shape. We had the M20 bridge we are working on, but we were always looking out to see what, what's gonna happen, especially in the one-way pairs. So we initiated, we have a small, modest pot of money in Lansing that includes uh, being able to study things. We study things like uh, driveway access, um, safety, uh, intersections, uh, all, the, all kinds of things. So this was kind of timely to say, all right, there's a lot of activity happening in the Midland. There's uh, our bridge at M20. There's work being done downtown. There's you know work being happening, and, and we wanted to make sure that we could get out ahead of the curve when we got projects coming. So in 2015, I think it was right, I don't know, somewhere around 150,000 or whatever it was, we had a study initiated to talk about not only MDOT roads, but also the community and how traffic is gonna, gonna go through. We wanna make sure that we can move traffic through in a very safe manner and also make it a community uh, effort. Um, so that's when the study was done. Our director supported at the time to have a, um, a project where we would um, look at all those aspects we talked about. Um, so that was how the, the study was initiated. I think there's some, I think we're trying to clarify tonight what the trial was versus what the study was, because in the past there's been a lot of discussion about that, and those words have been interchanged. But um, that, that was how we can look at this. We have one-way one pairs in Saginaw, in Bay City, a lot of different places, and we are looking at those to reconstruct those in the future also, which there'll be studies conducted there. Um, so MDOT did initiate the study to, to have put that put together. There was one feasible alternative, and that's what um, we're talking about here, was to look at, okay, is there a possibility of uh, how, what, how many lanes do we need? Because we're not gonna base it on when the decision was made a long time ago by uh, the people who built it a long time ago, our forefathers, we want to make sure we can get it up to date because a lot of things change. Um, so the trial, this, uh, what was brought to there was saying, okay, now we have the study, we went to the council and said, um, we're not sure if this is gonna work. We have some numbers, they're preliminary. We look at capacity, we looked at the type of, um, we call them crashes, but they're basically anything from a fender bender to uh, whatever it is. We look at the type of crash patterns that are happening, The operations, the signals, all that kind of stuff. And then we said we, we think that we could, um, we could do this in the future, but we really were not not sure. That was when they said, well, we'd like to see about um, a trial basis to do this. Um, trial basis happen a lot. Uh, if, you, if you go in St. Louis right now, south of M46, we changed the striping from four lanes to three lanes, and we're gonna be doing a uh, a roadway work through that area, and we wanted to do that ahead of time to see how it operate. We did that in Harrison, where we had a project come through. We restriped it ahead of time, and um, we also did it in Frankenmuth. If you remember back in the day, uh, that one turned out to not work out as well because of the capacity. But we we do a lot of these types of projects ahead of time. We would like to do that because we're anticipating somebody coming up and saying, hey, that's a great idea, let's change the configuration. After we had already designed the project, we got bulldozers ready to go, and that's gonna cost time and money. That's why we do these things. And Midland is a big, oh, that's a nice picture. Uh, Midland is a big, um, big community compared to these small communities, so I don't know what my next question was. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, okay, so, we have, what, we have a lot of times we have these traffic trailers we put out. That, they look at things like wh how well traffic's moving, what the turning patterns are, all those other kind of things. So when the trial was um, put up there, we said, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna monitor it right away. We, have a, we had a traffic trailer go out and monitor that, and um, we wanted to make sure that we didn't put it out there, and then all of a sudden, 
uh, all heck broke loose and there would be some real problems because safety is our number one, pro our number one concern. So we're still under the assumption. Uh, we've been looking at bringing the um, traffic trailers out every few months. Um, we're still under the assumption that if we have a, a problem out there that is considered to be a risk at all by not only the uh, motorists, but by the community residents, the, the patrons, everybody who uses, works in, and lives in the uh, community, we will pull that back. We will stop it. Um, we have folks, you may have met them, that are at the Mount Pleasant office. This is their, their area. They know all the intricate details of what's going on, and they have been looking at this all along. In fact, they look at all of the crashes that happen, whether it be, if, if there's a police report, our folks have access to that, and they end up pulling that data and analyze the data. So that is continuing to happen as far as the crashes go. They put them in different categories, the different types of patterns that happen, and then we can look at what is the effect of it. Is it the effect because of the uh, only two lanes, or is it the effect because of you know um, so whatever types of things that have changed out in the in the area? So um, the city. Uh, at this point, we have, MDOT has been saying all along, we have, a, we have a, um, a bridge out here where we're reconstructing M20 bridge. By the way, it's a beautiful bridge. And that has caused, because of the rivers in the area and everything, caused traffic to go around, you know, overall. I mean, we're taking US 127 to Meridian Road, all those other kind of ways. So traffic will naturally go down when we have construction happening. So during this time, we've said, we're gonna continue this trial all the way until we finish the M20 bridge. That is our goal. So we can bring back the traffic patterns that were there originally, okay? At least the, the volumes, and we're gonna monitor that. So we get a chance to, we got the information beforehand, we got the information during all the chaos that happened in the uh, construction that's going on, and then we're gonna have the bridge open. So we'll be able to compare that. When we'll have all the information back, when it'll be the right time to be back to normal, uh, I don't know that. We anticipate it'll be quite quickly because it's a long detour around. Um, so that is what will happen. Um, can MDOT stop this? Um, it's not us that wants to stop anything. We're taking a neutral position. But what we, we wanna have happen is um, if there is something that, that is catastrophic, we will, but we need to make sure that we have all the information ahead of time uh, after the bridge is done. So that way we consider a decision that would be made to say we can have uh, buttles uh, down to a two lane in the future when we uh, reconstruct this. By the way, we are not looking at reconstructing this right away. This is outside of our five year plan but it is something that we look at in these one-way pair situations like we showed the different uh, areas. I don't know if I, I'm just gonna continue to talk, so yes. Thanks. All right, thank you, Bob. Okay, so with that, we're gonna dive into our first two objectives that we have. So if you recall, the first one is accommodate current and anticipated future traffic, and the second being um, to enhance safety for all modes of transportation. So the study considerations that were done as part of um, the 2016 study, it did look at the fact that the roadway is a status as a business route and it's a principal artery within the city of Midland as well as connecting people from um, within the region, including Bay City and Mount Pleasant. It looked at future growth and current trends in traffic. And it also had um, in mind all users of the corridor, including semis and personal vehicles. We had had, we've had quite a few comments or questions related to what was considered at that time. There's some measurements that's involved now when we move into the trial phase. So we had the study and now we're into the trial phase. So you hear Bob talk about the types of information that they're collected, which you see here is the traffic speed and volume, including traffic flow monitoring, speed analysis and intersection performance. On many occasions, you'll see the trailers that are out there that are collecting that information. When it comes to the safety information, that's by and large being monitored by both MDOT and the city through corridor crash data. And I do have Lieutenant Mike Sokol here that's gonna talk about what the MPD collects when they go on site of a crash. Hello, uh, again, my name is Lieutenant Mike Sokol. I've been with the Midland Police Department now for uh, just over 20 years. I had about uh, 13 years of road experience. 
before I uh, started going through the promotion process in which I stopped really um, investigating crashes. However, as a supervisor, I uh, approved them. So what we mainly look for when we get to a crash, very rarely are we ever witnesses to a crash. Um, we'll dis be dispatched to a, a crash scene. We'll note the date and time of the incident and the current location. Uh, if it's within an intersection, intersection is defined anywhere within 150 feet of the crossroads. So that's where an intersection is considered. Uh, we also look at, I want to mm -hmm. say there's over um, 40 other items that my, I have my officers look at while at the crash. Obviously, we want to speak to both drivers involved if it's a dual car crash. A single motor vehicle crash, we'll talk to the individual driver and uh, we'll try and locate as many witnesses as possible. Um, a lot of the times, again, we look at the area, uh, the weather, and then we look at the vehicles to determine where the crashes occur or how they crash. So it, the, the corners of the car, the sides of the car would determine whether it's an angle crash, um, side swipe, rear end, things like that. Um, we also look at, um, we asked the, the drivers uh, what they were doing prior to the crash. I know some of you were at that prior meeting uh, and I explained that you know a lot of times we're not there and if someone's doing something that they're not supposed to be doing, not too often do they tell us. Okay, so if they're texting or driving, unless we have a witness that can absolutely identify them as texting and driving or eating a sandwich or reading a book, we really can only go by what that one driver says. So to say that, you know, we'd love to sit there and say that we, we, we get the most accurate information. Unfortunately, um, we do the best we can. And because we understand the importance of the data that is given to MDOT to make these decisions. Uh, we also note the injuries. Uh, we have five codes for injuries. Uh, injuries go from ultimately zero, which is a no injury crash report, uh, a possible injury, and as soon as that's labeled as a possible injury, that goes in as a, a personal injury crash. So that could be someone complaining of uh, simple soreness to the shoulder, uh, to from, from the seat belt, to maybe uh, an injury that they, they claim, but they don't want any kind of EMS or anything like that, that they can just get up and walk away. That's one of the classifications. The other one is uh, a suspected minor injury uh, that, that would be an injury, uh, bloody nose, something that's evident to someone at the scene. Again, nothing that is going to be uh, transported to the hospital or EMS, bloody nose, scratches, uh, unfortunately sometimes teeth get knocked out and things like that. That's, that's another injury. We then have a, a suspected serious injury. Now these are the crashes where the, uh, the, the person is, it's, they're injured, uh, it's, it's not a fatal crash, but they need to go to the hospital. Uh, they need to get transported by EMS. It's, it's, a, it's a serious injury, but it's not a fatal. And then we have our fatal crashes. Obviously, those are uh, the most severe. Um, again, we, we take into everything into consideration. We have uh, from, uh, we keep track of how many people are in the vehicle, where they're seated, whether they're wearing seat belts, um, all the way up until uh, if they felt that the driver was maybe having a medical condition before the crash. Uh, once we get there, uh, we, we again look at the crash scene itself. We determine where it happened. Uh, you know, we, we discussed uh, the, the uptick in, in red light uh, crashes. Uh, those would be like an angle crash. And, uh, but then we're also doing a lot of like side swipe and, and things like that. We, we take all those into consideration when we do these crash reports. Again, we do our best to make sure that we get the most accurate information. Uh, it's a very detailed report. MDOT gets a lot of information, and um, that's all I can promise is that we do our best to make sure that the, the information is accurate and uh, detailed. So. Thank you, Lieutenant. So with that, we move into our first table discussion. So just a reminder, um, the discussion at the tables is going to result around what types of additional criteria or things that we should be considering, or do you think we should be considering as it relates to these two um, criteria that we discussed. Um, so again, I know the mayor touched on this, but we do want you to uh, designate someone to take notes at your table, so a table secretary, and then also a table spokesperson, because following the criteria, we'll actually go one by one to the different tables and allow for the spokesperson to provide uh, the information and the discussion that was talked at at the tables. We are going to give about five to seven minutes on this objective, and with that, I'll put the two objectives up and encourage you to start talking. Next two objectives. Thanks everyone for that discussion.
All right. Very good. Okay, thanks everyone for for that discussion. One thing I do want to make note of is that um, we do have the written sheets at your table and we do plan on collecting those. So if you would like to add some written comments in addition to the comments that you're talking about verbally at your table, please feel free to do so. We will be collecting all those note sheets. So uh, feel free to fill those out. Okay, we're going to continue on if we could finish up with the conversations. So the next two objectives that we have um, that were outlined by the study is to increase neighborhood connectivity and to improve non-motorized mobility. So what do we mean by neighborhood connectivity? So a couple of the objectives, or not really objectives, but purposes of neighborhood connectivity is the idea that street networks matter. So we don't operate our streets within a vacuum. They're not independent of one another. They're very much part of a network that facilitates not only vehicle traffic, but also pedestrians and bicyclists, um, people that are choosing to drive different kinds of vehicles, um, and that is all part of a broader network. As part of that network, we have arterials, we have regional connector, connectors, we have US highways. All of those seek to do different functions and provide a connection that's a little bit different um, from maybe a local street than it is from a business route. So we have, when we think about these roads, we have to think about the network itself of not only the roads themselves, but everything that's around them and the context that surrounds them. One of the things that it's important to point out is that when you have a network and you have fast-paced, high um, multi-lane routes, those can provide barriers to other streets or other types of um, roads that are intersecting with those. And so what we have at this um, intersection, or not really an intersection, but what we have at the corridor itself is really a barrier that's formed between Midtown and our downtown. And the three lanes, um, fast-paced travel, uh, that not only provides barriers to those um, in vehicles trying to make turns or the like, um, but also for pedestrians and bicyclists. So that's what we talk about and think about when we have neighborhood connectivity. If we look at this spatially, you can see the outline of the Downtown Development Authority District in yellow, and you can see Indian and Buttles in the dark gray, and then you have other connecting main streets that lead into our downtown area. So you have down here to the south, you have Cronkite and George that forms, forms Poseyville and forms a very important connection down towards Midland Township and to areas to the south of the city. You have M20 that goes this way and connects out towards Mount Pleasant and the western parts of Midland County. Of course, you have Main Street that continues on into the city limits. And then you have the one-way pairs of Ashman and Rod on either side of Grove Park that connect into the central part of the city in the circle. We have, of course, neighborhoods that surround this. So you have Midtown neighborhood as well as the historic district neighborhood just off to the sides of downtown. And so thinking about those all within a broader network and all within a connected area is one of the objectives or one of the, um, uh, the thoughts behind the study itself. Moving into non-motorized mobility, there's a bit of an overlap because what we want to think about is not only a network that serves people in all ranges and all modes of transportation, but we also want to design human-scaled types of things on the streets themselves. So designing for people, and that includes things like sidewalks, it includes things like bike lanes, it also includes um, areas that you walk from where your parked car vehicle is to um, accessing a business and everything in between. All of that is really the pedestrian scale environment um, that we interact with. We have to think about bikeability and walkability, not only through the corridor, but also traversing or crossing the corridor. And then again, Battles and Indian are not only in and of themselves important roads, but they're also part of a broader network when it comes to non-motorized transportation. And when we begin to look at the map of things when it comes to non-motorized transportation, you begin to understand that our network is much more complex than I think the average map shows. And so what you see here in the purple dashed areas is non-motorized paved trails. Those that go through the Grand Curve, circle around Dow Diamond, continue down on the behind Ro Riverside Place uh, to the Tridge, and then form the Pier Marquette heading out towards the northwest. You also have connections at the Tridge towards Chippewa Nature Trail, and then connectivity into Chippewa, uh, Chippewasi Park. Those are off-street types of facilities. You see the slender purple lines are indications of where we have sidewalks within this area, and that's a form of non-motorized transportation infrastructure. But we also have on-street um, infrastructure for non-motorized, and particularly bicyclists with our sharrows or our um, bike lane um, or shared bike lanes on Indian and Rod. We have a designated bike lane on Indian, and then we have a designated bike route, which goes on McDonald, on Grove, and then Haley and Fitzhugh. So these are part of that network that we have to think about when we're considering um, changes to this corridor or any corridor. 
one of the things that was produced as part of the study was this graphic here, which showed using that, if you can recall back to the preferred analysis in that yellow boxed area, there were some ideas that were thrown out within the study of what you could use that additional space for. And a lot of times we hear, well, is this not a bike lane? Or why, if this is a bike lane, why are there no bikes in it? The reason is this is still a trial, and the final decision on what this is going to be used for has not been made. These were simply samples that were put within the study itself. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> really advanced. There we go. OK. All right, so some of the things that you see here are dedicated bike lanes. They're protected bike lanes. They're things that are delineated from traffic. And that, again, is just one sample that was put out as part of that study. So with that, we're going to move into our second table discussion. And we want to ask you, what are some additional things we should consider as it relates to increased neighborhood connectivity? Thinking about midtown, thinking about downtown, thinking about historic district. And not too far off of that is the cultural area with Midland Center for the Arts and the City Library and Dow Gardens. Um, so what are the additional things we should consider when it comes to neighborhood connectivity? After you talk about that, then move into improved non-motorized mobility. And what are some additional things we should be considering as it relates to pedestrians and bicyclists and users and how they coexist with uh, vehicle, vehicles not only on uh, streets, uh, but also within the broader network that we highlighted here. We're going to go ahead and do about 10 minutes of discussion there. last two objectives that we're going to talk about really lead into a bit more of the why. We've hit on the why in the last two objectives of why we would talk about this as it relates to non-motorized connectivity, as it relates to neighborhood connectivity. Now we're going to talk about the why behind the context-sensitive design and then the economics. The pure economics are the benefit that we could receive or possibly realize within our downtown district. So the next two objectives that we're going to dive into, if we could finish up the conversation so folks can hear. Um, include the context-sensitive design. So what does this mean? So context-sensitive design is really about designing roads that balance a variety of variables more than simply just moving traffic. So when you look at context-sensitive design, you think about things like economics and social benefits, environmental benefits. So it's more than just getting vehicles from point A to point B, but it's starting to look holistically at the context and the really the trade-offs that that roadway is providing within uh, the broader um, understanding of the neighborhood. So context-sensitive design really has to be thought about as a variety of, of factors. Well, you may hear context-sensitive design, as Bob talked about, in sort of the process that's being followed. And the process of context-sensitive design is really engaging stakeholders in doing a process that in, isn't really done in a vacuum so much just by traffic engineers, but really tries to get at what the community is desiring and what other um, property owners and surrounding neighborhood uh, members are desiring for the street. So really to understand the economics, you have to go and think about the history of downtown planning. So on your tables, we do have a number of handouts that talk about timelines, important timelines within downtown planning. Um, you also have frequently asked questions that are within that document as well. And that information is all on the city's website, and we'll have a, the web address here at the end of the, t um, the presentation. But when we talk about the history of downtown planning, this is why we, um, or this is how we get to the why behind the economics. So if you think about Midland and the evolution of our downtown, you had the historic Main Street going from Poseyville to Jerome and M20. And by and large, that was where kind of the core or the economic vitality of the commu community was for a number of years. Of course, we have lots of history beyond that. And we've expanded into a, a large industrial area, a lot of residential neighborhoods. But really, this was and, and where Midland got started was in uh, the area around the confluence of the Chippewa and the Tidbawassee. But starting back in 1997, so this is really about 100 years into Midland's history, we started to plan at the city for more of an expanded downtown district. So the orange uh, polygon that you see here is really the confines of the district at that time in the late 90s. But at the time, the master plan began to envision more commercial, more office use out into the surrounding um, blocks that are around Indian and Buttles, but also down towards where East End is currently located into Grove Park, and then further closer to where the one-ways come together and form Eastman Avenue off to the north here. So again, this was a plan established in 1997. <clears throat> the current master plan that we have today was the iteration that was done back in 2006 and 2007, which looked at expanding a mixed-use type of district in downtown, uh, far beyond the, uh, the, the delineation of Buttles and, and Cronkite and Jerome but the full area to include Indian and Buttles, half of the block into Grove, 
and then over towards the ballpark area. So if you look at the city's master plan today and the land use map that guides things like zoning considerations, site plan review, um, all of that is being guided by this document that was developed during uh, the mid-2000s. It was also the master plan that came out of meetings in a box. I don't know if anyone here remembers meetings in a box at that time. We have a few hands, a couple head nods. Um, but that was the public engagement strategy that the city used at that time. And what came back was we want a more vibrant downtown. We want an expanded downtown. We want to have things in our downtown, like full storefronts and a variety of types of services, um, Woolworths or something like that coming back. That's the type of commentary that was happening at that time and what ultimately resulted in the expanded downtown vision that we currently have. <clears throat> a couple other things that took place. We had an establishment of a downtown development authority back in 1989, and that's a tax increment finding, financing authority that is geared towards uh, reinvesting dollars within that specific district to benefit that district. And so you have um, an area that included kind of the proper of downtown um, back in the 80s and 90s. And then that was expanded in 2012 to include the full area that you see here highlighted in blue. So of course, this includes Indian and Buttles as they traverse their way through uh, this part of the city. <clears throat> so when we talk about economic development, we think about the, the vision that the city has for its master plan and the types of development that we want to take or see take place within these blocks. So the vision of the master plan lays out really a, a few objectives, and it's, it's a very long document, but I have some highlights here. And one of the things that they want to add or things that we do um, year after year within the strategy of the DDA is including adding density within the downtown district. So building more buildings, having more offices, more residential, more civic uses, more lodging uses, things that we've seen in the last few years um, that have taken place and are continuing to be proposed and breaking ground. The concept of mixed-use buildings, that's something that we've always had on our main street. We've had a lot of buildings that have um, retail on the main floor with residential on the second floor. That's a mixed-use style building. And so what you see within the vision of the master plan is more of that type of mixture of uses. More vertical mixture as opposed to horizontal because, again, it's, ad it's about adding density. Not 12-story buildings, but more three- or four-story buildings or even two-story buildings. So again, it's about adding additional dining, retail, offices, lodging, all for the benefit not of just downtown, but for the benefit of all of Midland residents. Having that vibrant downtown where people can go, where they can um, spend time with other residents, invite people and into the city and, and do all those things that they're here for business, that type of thing, that was the vision and still is the vision of the city's master plan. The last concept that we want to touch on is this concept of infill uh, redevelopment. And that's something that I know I've talked about in the walking tours but it's this concept of taking property that's used for a certain purpose today and then redeveloping it to be something that um, has more value and more vit um, vibrancy into downtown. It's important from a municipal perspective because you already have investment that's taken place in your downtown for roads and infrastructure and other types of public amenities. And if you can increase the, the value on the properties and have people develop more than what's currently there, you have a much higher return on investment for the public sector than if you're doing greenfield expansion and sprawl development out at the fringe. So there's a financial benefit to the city of trying to encourage this type of development. And Midland's not unique in wanting that kind of development. It's happening all over the country to try and do incentivizing and trying to get new infill redevelopment because of that public benefit and that return on investment. So when we talk about mixed use, this is not what we have in the vision for the city. Oh, geez. Sorry about that. We'll get back open again. But I think what we've heard a couple times in front of our planning commission and certainly in discussions when it comes to the master plan is when you think about mixed use planning, most people envision kind of this New York or Chicago or um, midtown Detroit or downtown Detroit type of setting. That's not at all what's envisioned within the master plan. Now, will planners in Detroit say mixed use when they're talking about a style of development like this? They will. So there's the same kind of overlap of the, the terms that are being used as we zoom through. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, but really, at the end of the day, we're trying to talk more about this style of development that we've seen in our downtown and also within our midtown. So this is just a couple of examples on Main Street where we have Pizza Baker, um, you have a uh, new distillery that's being talked about next door as part and residential above the business that's there as well. You have that all along Main Street with residential that's above um, retail and office uses. Mixed use can also be a mixture of retail with office above, um, or it can be um, 
offices on the main floor with, with residential. Really, it's just about a, a matter of simply mixing the vertical uh, nature of the uses. Some other examples within other communities in the state include um, things like this on the left, which is kind of a remake of an older building, something that we may have similar with old brick buildings in our downtown. Um, but this is new construction of a mixed-use variety where you've got a two-story structure with a uh, rooftop deck um, and a use on the main floor that's different than the use on the second floor. So that brings us into our last table discussion. And so what we want to hear from all of you is what are some additional things that we should be considering? Or what are the things that you value when it comes to context-sensitive design, thinking about all of the objectives of the city and how does that relate to planning for Indian and Buttles? And then what do we want in our, in our corridor and what do we want in new development when it comes into our downtown? Um, you've heard about the vision of, of the city's master plan, but what's some additional things we should be considering that maybe we aren't at this point? So with that, we will open it back up to table discussions about five minutes, and then after that, we'll move into the table reports. All right, thanks everyone. We're gonna go ahead and move into our table reports. So as soon as we can get back together and silent again, we're gonna go ahead and move into the last portion of our agenda this evening. All right, thanks everyone. Okay, so we do want to be respectful of everyone's time, so we do want to move into the table reports now. And what we're going to do is actually have Selena Tisdale, our DDA director, is going to be going around with a mic, and we're going to go to each of the individual tables and have the spokespeople uh, be able to report back at, at this time. So we want to focus in on the six criteria. We want to hear what are the themes at your tables. So what are the things that you heard as it relates to the six um, objectives and the criteria? Um, and what are some of the other things that were discussed? Um, we may get to a point where we're hearing some repeat things. So if you do hear, well, you know, table four said very similar things that we did. So go ahead and just kind of summarize as we go along. Um, we are recording this for MCTV, so we do have cameras that are here. We wanted that to be able to be played back. So with that, we do have the microphone, and it's very important that in order for us to catch the audio, that everyone does have a microphone when they are speaking. So with this, um, this will all be comments addressed to council. And so we do have council over on this side of the room. Uh, we'd encourage you to be uh, brief and concise in your comments and also respectful of others, uh, refraining from clapping and, and simply just allowing for us to move forward efficiently through this process. So do we have any brave tables that want to start off? We do have a hand over here. Make curves, the, uh, wide curves for the trucks coming onto Buttles and two lanes don't allow for much wide turns. And the, uh, you need to have cutouts because there will be right and left turns from traffic and two lanes don't allow for many turns into the businesses that um, Buttles goes by. Do we want to do all our comments? Okay. And actually, before, I should have mentioned this too. So if you could introduce yourself before you speak, give your name and, and address, that would be great for the record. Thank you. My name is Beth, and I'm from uh, Leonard Lane. Uh, then the, na the number two, the na neighborhood connectivity. Uh, Grove Park is increasing access to Grove Park. And the non-motorized uh, mobility question, the bike abilities of Buttles and uh, bike availability to get onto the streets uh, in the downtown. And number three, context-sensitive design must uh, move traffic and how people live into the downtown area. So we need to get a better design for Buttles cutouts and for turns and for people to want to be a part of it. And economic development, keep the lodging and the restaurants, make it prettier, develop the waterfront, use the water, and better housing downtown. Not quite so costly. Good evening, thank you. My name is Rich Seamer. I am in the third ward with uh, Steve. Um, it was interesting to hear someone talk from MDOT who said moving traffic in a safe manner is, is critically important. 
and also that safety is their number one concern. If that is indeed the case, what we have seen so far in the um, Buttle Street activity shows that it is a failure. Moving from three lanes to two lanes with the same amount of traffic, what you do is boost traffic density by 50%. If you take a look at Google studies of um, uh, traffic accidents and congestion, probably the seminal one was done at the University of Maryland in 2003. And what it shows basically is that as uh, traffic increases, accidents will increase. And um, we have not heard anyone yet tell us why the diet. What will the diet achieve? We have heard about connectivity. How do you measure connectivity? Have you seen any improvement in connectivity? We have heard nothing about that. We have also seen a lack of transparency in what the objectives of this study are. What are the long-term achievements that you wish to accomplish? We don't have a clue. Accidents are up by at least 40%. That is unacceptable to the public. I have seen probably about seven letters to the editor. Not one has said, this is a wonderful idea. None. Is there anyone in this room who does not have money involved in this think this is a great program? Five of yeah. you? Mr. Mr. Seamer, if you could address your comments to council, this is a report back to council. Yep. Uh, they talked about a, a bike lane. You would, you would not want to put a bike lane on the most heavily traveled, fastest traffic in the city. You want to put a bike lane on a street where they're going to be safe to move as they will. You wouldn't put a bike lane on I-75 going up to the bridge nor would you put a bike lane on the busiest road in Midland. That doesn't make any sense at all. Um, yes, we've improved uh, mobility, and if you talk about economic development, we all favor economic development. However, we see no connection between Buttles three lanes to two lanes and economic development. We all support that development, but we think they are totally separate issues. We think, as I'm saying, there's a disconnect between the economic and social development and what is taking place on Buttles. If you want economic development, what you've got to do is make driving to downtown Midland easier and safer. And the Buttles activity works in the opposite direction. Thank you. Right, next table. Thank you. Um, Emily Schaefer, Sudbury Court. And I just want to say thank you to, we had a really great discussion and um, yeah, it would have been nice to have a nice meal too. So, um, no, not saying like the city. Okay, never mind. All right. It was fun to get to know um, some people um, nearby, and I really appreciate um, the opportunity to, to chat about it, too. Um, so in regards to traffic and safety, some of the uh, points that we wanted to um, be considered and just chatted about were just accommodating the current and anticipated future traffic. Um, we talked about, uh, we had a nice history um, conversation about um, Dow plants and where entrances used to be and how some of that traffic flux has, has changed. Um, and so that was a, a great conversation to, to have. Um, and then we talked about just how one-way uh, roads have not always proved to be welcoming um, to outsiders that are coming into the community. Um, and so that was something that was mentioned. Um, again, the traffic volume has changed. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, the number of employees to the Dow plant was 11,000, uh, was one of the comments, and now it's um, about 1,000. Um, and so we want to give, um, oh, the other thing was we want to give people opportunity to um, turn downtown. And so that was something that I think really resonated with our, our table too, and uh, giving people opportunities to turn. Um, in regards to, which one was next? 
non-motorized mobility and neighborhood um, connectivity. Um, we really would love to see more timed lights for non-motorized um, uh, uh, folks to come through. Um, and then um, making it really more attractive for folks. Yeah, so having the, the timed crossing as well. Thank you. Um, so time crossing lights would be wonderful. Um, and then really just making it more attractive for people um, to, um, to travel on bikes or walking or um, anything non-motorized. Um, and then uh, the bike lanes, we had a, a conversation about using a sidewalk versus using the road. And, um, and so that I think was a, a lively discussion. We would like to um, really see more um, work being done around um, encouraging more people um, to drive uh, or to use their um, their bikes and and to um, travel um, in non motorized ways as well. Um, and then in regards to economic development and, and context sensitive design, um, we would love to have grocery and, and other retail and attract um, investors into downtown. Um, and we wondered if those two streets are, um, you know, something that will attract people downtown. Um, and then we talked about too extending really um, it's not just downtown is not just Main Street it's um, it's multiple blocks and we really that was something that really resonated with our group um, and we also talked about uh, farmers market and having more parking for farmers market we talked about having some farmers market buddies so that we could team up and and um, uh, and then another thing that just was brought up too was uh, we really would love the idea of having restaurants on um, the water. And so that was something that, um, yeah, we would love to see. So um, I think all in all, we were encouraged by the discussion and we were encouraged by um, what we were seeing too. So, hi, I'm Michael Burhans, Ward 5. Um, one of the first things I'd like to ask the gentleman from MDOT. Because this is something that you very carefully steered around from here. When you did your initial presentation, you said you did the studies, you do studies all the time, that's what you should do. I agree with that. And then you said they said they wanted to try the road diet. Who specifically is they? Uh, the only viable option at the time was the the three lanes of two, and then we were approached um, to say, what can we do? Can we do something in this area? The data showed that we would be able to potentially use, be able to potentially have two lanes, but we didn't know we we're not going to base it on theory alone. So we had to look at what are we going to do to be able to, to um, see about how this is going to work. The opportunity came up that said, Let's look at the bollards and be able to do that. The, the city council then approved that through their um, their votes, and that's what that's how it happened. We then put it up there as a support. We get this all the time. We make sure there's a letter, there's a resolution because we want to make sure that um, the, all the community is worked out. This part here is, a, is the best part of it because you can now gather information as we go. That in no way addressed my question. At some point. Somebody approached you and said, this study is a good idea. Let's try it. Can we have the name of that person? Was it an elected official? Was it from, from an NGO? Because we've gotten multiple stories, and it changes almost on a weekly basis. We're told you did it. Then we hear they did it. Then we hear the Midland Baseball Foundation did it. Then we hear that uh, Michael Hayes did it. And nobody will say, somebody at some point approached MDOT and said, let's do this study. Can we have that name? Somebody approached one of my staff. And it was, it was looked at and somebody. said, somebody approached from the city. Okay? And this, we said, OK, this is a viable option. What we wanted to do, though, is to te test it in the field. The, the consultants Again, said. Again, that doesn't address the question. I do not know who. Oh, why did we do the study? You said they approached you. Who is they, specifically? The road diet trial? Yes. 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about the road. Red. Initially, it was a 2015 corridor study. These are normal studies that we engage with the community to identify what the future needs would be once we are in a position to do uh, construction, uh, any kind of remodeling of the roadway. Yes, and I stipulated that's a good thing. But then he said after they did that, somebody approached him about doing the diet. Because your question went back and forth. You asked a question about how this... You know exactly what I was asking. Somebody Sorry, at some point I'm, started this. I was still this. speaking. You asked a question about how the study was started. This is how it's done, folks. And then you asked a question about who approved the trial. No, who asked him? Nobody asked. We identified the location. He's as an area that needed to be studied. Are we gonna get an answer to this? She is not answering my question, she's obfuscating. I, all I know is that I was, I was brought, it was brought to me by saying the city is supportive of this option. We then said, hey, we can put bollards up, and then it was approved. MDOT put the bollards up. MDOT looked at it, our director supported it, everybody supported it. We all agreed that it would be good to do a trial run. I don't know why we would be concerned about who started or who didn't start this part. Follow the money. That's why we're concerned. The, the good thing is... Who's going to end up with this land? Well, the good thing is that we are, we're making sure that this is correct. We've got to make sure it's safe. We've got to make sure it's right. And to do it in this time is a really good opportunity. At a time when you admit that the construction on the bridge is skewing the data. At, right now, we're going to continue to to watch it and continue to wait till it comes back. If it was gonna be come out to be catastrophic immediately, we would have pulled it off. I think I, I talked about that. So I think we're all in agreement that this study is gonna come out to an, a, a, some type of a solution that says it is, to data-wise, uh, it could work. Honestly, there's a lot of people in this city that feel the study is already written and that the uh, foregone conclusion that this That's was not done true. on purpose, which is why you're trying to steer the discussion and gish gallop us with data that's irrelevant. You're right. I, I Ladies mean, and it. gentlemen, this is an opportunity. We have a room full of people. This isn't just your opportunity to nope. speak. So I believe we've heard your question. Is there anything else that your table came up with that yes. you would like to address, please, yes. to council? I would like, lacking buzzwords, an explanation of how putting more vehicles in a smaller space creates safety. All we get is buzzwords. And the other thing is, who chose which lane to close, and why is there such inadequate signage? People turning, coming from the west on M20 turn into the, turn into the bollards, have no idea they're there, there's no warning. and the other thing is, when this is all said and done, and this is rammed through, who's going to get that land? Are the taxpayers going to own it, or is some developer going to get it, just like when you created the green space in the 90s? And it all ended up in developers instead of the parkland we were promised. Thank you. Before we go on, I understand that there are people feel one way and there are people feel the other. But often when you applaud, that makes somebody else feel uncomfortable. The goal of tonight is to have an opportunity to hear what, you, what folks want to say, and we would really like to hear that. So if you could please just work with us like we asked in the beginning, we'd greatly appreciate it. So we'll get to that as soon as we get through the tables. We'll give individuals an opportunity to come up and speak. Uh, I'm J.W. Fisher. I live on Sugnet. Uh, our table had quite a bit of back and forth, so my notes uh, kind of reflect that. We were going to have another spokesperson, but nobody else could read my writing, so, uh, <laughs> so I'm both tonight. Uh, so we, one of the things that we had heard, or some at our table had heard, that one of the objectives is to cause congestion, which is to slow traffic. Others thought, well, it is to slow traffic. Uh, and that's, that's for reasons of connectivity and pedestrian safety, uh, but not necessarily to cause a traffic jam. Um, so I said, is this good? And uh, maybe it will be safer for pedestrians, but uh, it's gonna be cause a problem turning left or right. 
uh, that's going to cause road jams and the response was, well, maybe we can have turn lanes that will help that. And then just a, a question is, what is traffic low now compared to when the roads were designed? So what was the traffic per hour or daily, daily uh, traffic load com then compared to now? And then we thought it came down to just a basic question is, uh, do we prefer a thoroughfare that favors vehicles only? Or another way, should that road service vehicles? Is that the is that the roadway purpose? Just to service the vehicles that are trying to get from one end of the road to the other, or should it balance the needs of motorists, uh, pedestrians, and the adjacent neighborhoods? Uh, and just kind of a philosophic difference is probably not a right or wrong answer. There's a lot of very strong concern about stopping traffic at lights unnecessarily. Um, and then when it came to neighborhood connectivity, are we being selfish in the city of Midland? Um, maybe improving things for our neighborhoods in our city at the expense of motorists trying to get from one of the towns to the other or from Mount Pleasant to Bay City. We all like what's happening downtown. We'd all like to see that development extend to Midtown in a way that will connect the neighborhoods across the one way downtown. Um, some of us thought that the two one-way pairs effectively uh, act as a barricade to the neighborhoods. And uh, just like the railroad tracks, the proverbial on the wrong side of the tracks, there's, you end up on the wrong side of the one-ways. Some of us believe we need to calm traffic if we're going to extend that economic development uh, across the one-ways. And then it just comes down to the basic philosophy is the purpose of that road to move traffic from one end to the other exclusively, or is, or is there a broader community uh, need that that road needs to serve, which would lend itself to this calming. So, so that uh, pretty faithfully records what our discussion. Thank you. Okay, um, my name is Megan Yasak, and I live in Midland. And um, let's see, I'll try to get these notes to go through the questions. So, um, regarding the question of accommodating the current and anticipated future traffic, um, one thing that I did want to point out is that the 2016 study does show that the current design of two one-way pairs got a passing grade for both the current flow of traffic and the future projected flow of traffic. So just to kind of address the point that there was only one viable alternative, it seems that we actually have two viable alternatives, which is a three-lane solution and a two-lane solution. Both would accommodate the future and uh, current, or yeah, for future and current flow of traffic. We did have some safety concerns about using the two-lane solution to try to accommodate that traffic because we've seen examples of different types of accidents and safety concerns some of the folks have addressed big trucks trying to make wide turns, not having enough right and left turn lanes. So one of the things we thought was very important to increase safety in any design would be to make sure there are right and left turn lanes at intersections in the solution. Uh, let's see. Um, we also thought it would be more helpful to present the safety data on a linear um, graph as opposed to taking two pairing up year-on-year -year comparison, saying, oh, this year is a 40% over this year, and this year is a minus 7% over this year. We felt if you plot the data on a time series and you show all the crashes per year, then you can clearly see that there's actually been a 60% increase over the um, average of the prior nine years, and that the, pr the one year is 32% higher than any other year. So we, it kind of tells a different story, and it's a little easier and more user-friendly to look at if you plot the data on a graph and show kind of what the control limits were prior and whether they've moved or not. So we'd recommend doing that. Um, as far as um, increasing neighborhood connectivity and improving non-motorized mobility, um, our table really felt that was important to get people to use all the cool stuff downtown to have ways that people can get across M20. But we, we weren't necessarily sure that bringing that traffic onto M20, like bicycles and pedestrians along M20 was um, so much the issue as getting them across M20. But, um, well, across, you, yeah, Business 10, yeah. What, 
sorry, business 10. Um, so like, for example, some of the ways we thought of doing that were to have longer lights so pedestrians can cross, um, better quality sidewalks, wider sidewalks that are more inviting for the different uses, um, possibly even a pedestrian tunnel or non-motorized tunnel so that people can get under that road and get downtown. Um, we really felt like those near, nearby neighborhoods, a lot of those folks chose to live down there so they could access downtown and be close to downtown and walk downtown, so getting them downtown is important. Uh, we just weren't necessarily sure taking them along Business 10 was the, the preferred route. Uh, what else? Um, as far as um, context-sensitive design and supporting economic development, you know, we felt like a lot of the stuff that's happening downtown with the mixed use and was really great, really cool. A lot of us use all that, so we're happy to see that. And we would like to see that kind of economic development across the city and not just, you know, kind of in this one one or two blocks. Um, we did talk about the fact that having businesses that are open in evenings and weekends would also be really beneficial to enhance people's use of downtown. Um, let me see. Um, we did have some concerns about setbacks, like some of the new developments are so close to the road, and so one of the questions was, will that create um, context-sensitive design for the residential areas? Are you going to have you know, kids too close to the street and um, vehicles not able to see around the corner and that sort of thing. So one of the things we'd like to see built into future designs is the right amount of, I don't know, setback or outlaw or whatever you want to call it so that it's not, so that people who are using those businesses, for example, if you're sitting in outdoor seating at a restaurant, you don't feel like there's cars like crushing right up on you or, so we'd like to make sure that there's some thought put into the future design for that kind of safety. Did I cover everything? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie Broderick, uh, 909 Holy Road. We had a great discussion, and at our table, we did have varying viewpoints, which I found actually nice and refreshing. Uh, the table consensus, though, even though we had varying viewpoints, was that regarding traffic and safety, we all agreed that safety was a concern. And within that safety, uh, one side of that was semis need to continue to use the lanes because where else will they go? And on the other side of that, how are the residents and, pedest and pedestrians safely crossing those um, streets to downtown for downtown growth? Uh, regarding the non-motorized mobility and neighborhood connectivity, even again with the varying viewpoints that we all agreed that it would be important to slow the traffic and make it safe. Some of the ways that were discussed were adding clearly defined wide crossing areas, emph emphasis on the wide, that would be visible at night, clearly marked, and uh, reducing speeds. There was a discussion about whether or not elevated crosswalks would be sufficient, including um, whether or not costs would be uh, feasible. And again, it was mentioned that if you're going to make it walkable, you have to slow the traffic. And also there was a lot of discussion about timing of the lights and uh, reducing the timing of the lights. And then regarding economic development, some of the things that were mentioned that, that were discussed that wanted to be seen was more residential in the area, uh, more dining or facilities or eateries, a farmer's market was also discussed at the table and more parking specifically regarding like a parking garage. Uh, one thing that was mentioned that I think everyone at the table agreed upon was that what they're doing with the DDA is making tremendous progress, but the traffic is causing an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Sarah Whiting, I live in downtown Midland. And we had, a, we had some very uh, active discussions at our table. Joe is a great recorder. Um, and I, a lot of the items that we have mentioned, uh, councilmen, have already been mentioned, but I'll bring up some new ones, I think, or new emphasis. For the first two topics, uh, traffic and safety, 
um, we, we had quite a good point was made, which we all agreed upon, was that to do traffic count, you know, when you're looking at these streets like Indian and Buttles and for the volume, um, instead of just having just this little picture of even three years, to just look at the traffic count and to put, you mentioned a traffic counter on, this, on the road, so you would know what the volume is of the road and then see, you know, is that is two lanes adequate for that count? Um, and to so look at some of the national data, not just the small study. Um, and also, the question was raised, what was the data before the bridge? Um, uh, what was the traffic volumes before the bridge construction was happening? We've not seen that, and that might be an interesting um, a point to look at. Overall, we thought the traffic probably would not increase over the next, say, five to ten years. We thought we were, this is about it, except for once the bridge construction gets done. The topic three and four, uh, mobility and neighborhood connectivity. Uh, we had a little uh, discussion on is neighborhood connectivity important in Midland? Um, I, I think that's really the basis, uh, that's what we think is the basis of all this conversation about Indian Buttles is, is it important, is it a value in Midland? Should we want to be connected as community between the downtown area and the Grove Park area, you know, further north? And we saw the, you know, the expanded maps and things like that. That decision has been made, but, you know, that's really the conversation or part of the conversation here. Do we want to be connected? Um, and site, we talked about sight lines on corners. You know, you, you kind of get some spur topics here. We think that that's something that we'd like the city to be concerned about and, and think of in future development on any streets is the sight lines as you get to corners. Um, we discussed, does three lanes encourage pedestrians or not encourage pedestrians versus two lanes encouraging pedestrians and not encouraging pedestrians? So we talked about that for a while. Um, and I think overall, we wanted to encourage pedestrians. We, you know, this, this table as a group, I feel, felt we want to encourage pedestrian traffic. We want to encourage connectivity. We want that community feeling. Um, we, we definitely want the speed limit on Indian Buttles to be reduced. So um, however that can happen, you know, I, yes, you know, we threw out there, maybe we need a policeman on every corner, you know? Um, we, <laughs> we need a traffic light on every corner. We don't really like those two ideas, but they were brought up. Um, you know, how, how can we reduce the speed? Because I, that was something we all agreed upon is the speed limits are just way too fast on those roads. Um, they're not, yeah, no. And the fifth and sixth topics, um, Councilman, are economic development and context sensitive design. We all agreed we wanted a vibrant downtown. We felt that would be beneficial to the entire city of Midland, um, you know, in terms of people moving there, in terms of the people that are there. And then it gets into what is the definition of a vibrant downtown? Who does a vibrant downtown benefit? And we're looking at all of the age groups. Um, the, you know, the comment, the comment was made pretty strongly that a lot of people aren't going to downtown Midland. They're, they're not doing the shopping there. You know, why not? How do we? And so we're, we talked about how do we attract stores that we want to go to? How do we attract um, restaurants that we want to go to? And, and that's maybe a conversation for the future, but that was one of our big topics we all agreed on is we want to attract vibrancy in downtown Midland. We want to attract people to get there. Um, so, and we also must design anything on Indian Buttles to accommodate these businesses and uh, restaurants and whatever, you know, uh, community development in downtown Midland. Um, and I think our, actually the last comment that Joe wrote here was think win-win. Let's think how can, how can the future of this uh, project, this trial be so that everybody is, uh, is winning from it. So there you go. Thank you. Hi, Dana Cortine from Hidden Ridge. Um, so we talked quite a bit about uh, safety. There were a number of concerns. Um, however, it was interesting, while um, one person said I would never ride a bike across the six lanes, um, there was another consensus that walking across them using the, the crosswalks was not an issue at all. Um, so some interesting um, data there. Uh, there was a, a comment or two that um, the fact that people are angry about the road study diet 
it's probably causing more aggression, which could be a contributing fact to some of the safety issues that were realized. Um, there had been some rumor that the uh, reduction to two lanes would result in a uh, large number of traffic backups, um, but nobody at the tea, uh, table here had actually seen those realized. Um, so traffic does seem to be flowing. Uh, questions regarding um, the use of bikes, um, whether or not people would actually start using bikes if bike lines were uh, um, provided. Certainly we have seen an increase in bike usage recently. Um, having said that though, um, it would have been nice to actually incorporate that as a part of the study. Rather than making that extra lane unusable, um, allowing that for bike traffic to see whether or not it would actually be used could have been an interesting data set. Regarding the uh, de development downtown, um, there was a lot of excitement for what the area could be. Um, with different shops, different art stores, different restaurants. There was also a mention at this table of a grocery store slash pharmacy. Um, however, in order to enable that, um, the table asks that we seriously consider a look at parking options. Um, right now, there are stores today that are saying our customers don't have any place to park. The one parking lot is far away. Farmer's market gets filled up pretty quickly. So if we're serious about trying to build up the um, um, downtown area, we need to consider parking. Um, and also we need to consider possibly giving some incentives to new businesses. We want Midland to be the place for people to come, consider tax incentives, consider giving them some of that property that's unused today, but make it worth someone's while to come into the city. Thank you. So um, I'm John Bunch, I'm at the corner of Townsend and Pine in the mid Midland area. And <clears throat> if you ever have an opportunity, go to the Live Oak Coffee House. We have a mid Midland Neighborhood Association. It's great. Um, but um, I'm representing Lucky 13, table Lucky 13. And uh, we had a lot of varied discussion. Um, a, a lot of our discussion went beyond the issue of what the traffic study and traffic patterns imply. And uh, I'll talk about safety uh, when, we, when we commented on it and the stuff that deals specifically with traffic first. Um, before that, uh, just a personal anecdote. I work in Mount Pleasant. Every uh, night I come across the bridge um, and I turn on Main Street and take Main Street down to Townsend and then cross uh, north on Townsend to get to my house. So what I've done is choose an alternative road to get home, and I have very little experience with the actual road diet because of that. And that's something that is important to consider, you know. Um, and um, I think, um, you know, I get to see what's going on downtown Midland and be uh, frustrated by all the people that are crawling along at five miles an hour, looking at all the cool things that are going on in downtown Midland in their in their cars and stuff. Um, but here's uh, what was written down by Jess. Thank you, Jess, in terms of our notes. Um, uh, a note, 80% of the population will not benefit because they don't live in the area. Uh, where will the density come from? Uh, I think that's associated with the uh, economic development plan. Um, a question about how we define vibrancy. Um, um, and then some comments about whatever we do, um, one of the things that we need to be sensitive to is the property rights and how single family homeowners and single families uh, live in this area that we're considering develop, uh, developing. Um, there was a comment that the city master plan has, well, no real city master plan. What that really means is that master plan has changed lots and lots um, over the history of Midland uh, with different goals and objectives. Um, um, let me see. Um, we want uh, the community development initiatives and um, plans to be driven by a sensitivity to creating um, uh, places for small families to live, not just uh, uh, married or single professionals. Uh, you know, we, if you're really going to develop a, uh, a downtown that's vibrant with lots of opportunities for grocery stores to thrive or maybe a drugstore to thrive, it's that um, 
uh, it's that family unit that has more than just you know the 20 and 30 something professionals that we need to be sensitive to as well as the idea of promoting um, small businesses and s small businesses who own the buildings that they uh, that they occupy rather than um, rather than renting that space from uh, big real estate developers or landlords um, and I know a lot of uh, transitions have happened on Main Street because landlords anticipating whatever they're anticipating have raised uh, rents that has made small businesses uh, un, uh, unviable that r had been viable and would have continued to be viable without uh, those moves from, um, from their landlords. That's, um, in terms of the traffic patterns, um, we talked about the possibility of lights or signals stoplights at every block uh, coupled with pedestrian buttons so that if a pedestrian was at the crosswalk, they could stop traffic and walk across. As, and, and we recognize that sight lines and uh, easements were really important. Uh, there was a comment that the current situation because of the pre-existing trees being so close to the road, to the road in, in many blocks is dangerous uh, today because you drive up to the corner and you can't see the traffic that's coming. And that's particularly uh, crossing from the north down into downtown uh, on Butt and the Buttles, uh, the Buttles uh, corners are, are difficult. Um, and then one of the things that I will add is uh, a question about um, the constraints on this whole project. Because from my perspective, a lot of the problems uh, are associated with existing road patterns and uh, the idea that we have to have a major truck uh, corridor for trucks that are as big as you know two chassis um, uh, trucks full of very very heavy you know refuge and going right through downtown um, so is it how big can we think can we think about creating an alternative route for that kind of traffic? Can we think about saying, no, trucks can't come through downtown Midland. We'll have to f find another route. Um, and you know that might solve some of the problems, too. So thank you very much, and thanks to everybody that was at the table. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dave Kepler. Uh, we, our family actually owns about three uh, properties in downtown, including the apartments. So you probably can uh, guess my, my view. Um, but I'm going to probably re uh, represent the group's view if, if I could. Um, and I think if we just walk through it, I think the general consensus of the group was that no matter how we look at the data, the numbers look like the accidents have increased. Um, but I'd also say there's concern at just how uh, the confidence in the numbers. And I would just say the city works, you're in a city with a lot of people that look at numbers, and it's really hard with this data for those that look at data to get conclusions out of this, but the bottom line is the numbers look like they're going up is what the, the group here has said. Um, and the, the, I think there was another issue of just this idea of, I think the DOT getting clear on what it means if there's a significant catastrophic event, we know what that means, but how are you managing that and monitoring it? It wasn't very clear. So I would just encourage uh, on a personal level that we make sure if we're gonna get this data, it's really clear and grounded and people really understand and communicate that. Um, the second one was on no, um, the non-motorized question. I think there was general consensus that the bike traffic is not a primary driver in this, uh, and that was all, the, all of us agreed to that. Um, and then there was a pretty general view that um, okay, so we need to get across that road, and have we really looked at uh, better signals? Um, uh, we go across six lanes, or there are four lanes in Eastman and, and Saginaw was a consensus here. Have we looked at uh, putting those lanes in and stuff to work through? I think the bottom line point here was this is business 10. It's a uh, state-owned um, highway, and so how, do we, how does the city strategically address that? I think we would all like everybody to get through between 20 and 10, but we've got this problem in our city that this is where it goes and how do we deal with that reality? So I think that 
the table was looking for, hey, are there other ways to look at this, like traffic lights? Um, on e economic development, I don't think we talked a lot about the tie to the corridor, but I think we all view that we wanted a uh, structure with grocery stores, family restaurants, um, and making sure it's open for all incomes. So there's a concern that we collectively have that the way this is built today, that most of, it's very expensive to build downtown, therefore only large developments get built. And so how do we keep the um, all incomes available and integrated in the neighborhood downtown? And there's uh, some view, a minority view at this table that having those roads would be a good thing to help downtown and the others that kind of think that's not really connected to it at all. But I think the view is we do not want to develop downtown that just builds activity that people with that want to make smaller investments in homes and structures and businesses can't do. And we're worried that the structure right now doesn't allow for smaller investments in the community. So did I reflect that okay with you guys? Okay, good. So it wasn't all unanimous, but I thought I'd kind of give what the table felt. Thank you. Thank you. Tony Stamas, 2704 Walden Woods Court. Uh, great discussion at the table, varying opinions, varying perspectives. Um, and so, and on traffic and safety, there was a question about what the impact was starting this when the bridge was closed and um, uh, the, the impact that has in terms of how the, the information is relevant. Uh, a question about um, evacuation route, being business route 10. How, how uh, you know, is, the, is that evaluated? And is there, you know, discussions with emergency, with, with, be it ambulances or whatever, in terms of how, how they're impacted? Um, or how they would, so how is that weighed into the safety considerations? You know, a question about when we looked at it, uh, Buttles versus Indian, uh, why, why the selection there? Um, and is it having, w what's the impact it's having in terms of slowing speed down? Um, you know, uh, how is that measured? Is there an impact that that's actually having that impact um, when you look at pedestrian tra traffic? Um, on the no non-motorized mobility, um, other communities going through similar types of discussions. Um, what can we learn from their experiences? Um, you know, the one person had an experience of crossing the reduced lanes, that it was, it was, it was much, much easier. That was their anecdotal uh, perspective. Um, how, will the, how will the, during the trial, how will it measure the impact on the non-motorized traffic? Um, if, if it's gonna look at biking lanes, is this optimal in terms of biking lanes? And what's the impact on pedestrian traffic from midtown to downtown, and how is that going to be measured? And then, in terms of economic development, um, uh, question uh, was, uh, you know, what's the development strategy with respect to Midland going towards an Indian? Uh, I think, and uh, people have seen a lot of great things uh, in, in the downtown, and what's the impact um, if, if that footprint of the downtown is expanded in that way? So, um, really good discussion. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Hi, Elena Smith, Midlands. Um, so a lot of what we've talked about has already been covered, um, but we had a few questions. Um, so tra for traffic and safety, we wondered how the bridge construction is affecting the road diet data if we're doing or gleaning all this road diet data while the bridge construction is going on and a lot of people are avoiding the bridge, the M20 bridge area, um, and then it, the traffic increases back once the bridge construction is done, how's that gonna affect this area? Um, and then we also talked about why are we talking about reducing lanes um, for safety rather than focusing on safer crosses, safer crossings, like through the timings of the lights and the push buttons that we've already talked about. Um, and that's the same for connectivity. We think that maybe focusing on that would help connectivity rather than reducing the lanes. And then for non-motorized mobility and neighborhood connectivity, um, we wondered about, you not that much is just gonna change if you only change these two streets, but what about all the feeder streets that were mentioned on the maps, such as, you know, are there, are there bike lanes and are they, are they gonna be dedicated bike lanes? Is there gonna be sidewalk improvements? Because some of the sidewalks in Midtown are really hard to walk on, rollerblade on. Once you get down there, they just become really uneven. So are those gonna be fixed like on Ashman, Rod, Carpenter, Haley, um, Maine? Um, and would it be dedicated bike lanes or just op optional bike lanes like they are on Ashman? Um, and then we talked about a study, uh, uh, this is kind of what I talked about on there too, but of the crossing ability for walkers, 
um, and non-motorized people, people using wheelchairs, people using strollers, stuff like that. And then for economic development and context-sensitive design, we talked about if there are all of these buildings built downtown that are like two and three and possibly even four stories, like they said, if they're built into office buildings, where are all these people gonna park? Because office buildings hold a lot of people and they're all there mostly the same time of day. So there'd have to be a lot of parking structures to accommodate that. And then if they weren't parking structures but were instead housing for people, where are these people gonna shop? If we want them to have, have the downtown be a walkability um, or a walkable community where they can live and not have to leave, to live, they can't just shop at boutiques. They need like little grocery stores and little pharmacies and stuff like we've talked about. Um, and then the last point that we talked about is a quote that I um, that was said tonight um, during the presentation was, we're taking property and making it more valuable. And that was in the part about economic development. And while I think that economic development is very important, I think that we have to really think about how we do that. A lot of the housing that has been um, that has been torn down has been housing that has places that are rent by the rooms and you can rent them by the month and they may not be the most beautiful like houses or the most things that like draw attention to our city, but it's places where people live. It's low income, affordable, accessible housing and there's an extreme shortage of that in Midland, especially in the city. Um, and as a social worker, we really struggle to find places to put low-income housing, and a lot of that housing is, is very quickly going away. And we talked about how if it keeps, if the downtown keeps expanding with these office buildings and um, boutiques and restaurants and higher-priced condos and stuff into the Midtown area, that's another place where there's affordable family housing. So we were concerned about that. Thank you. never used one of these before. <laughs> I'm Karen Gibson and I live on Drake and at our table today I met a neighbor that I didn't know I had. Shock. Um, well one of the advantages of being one of the later tables a lot of what we discussed has our a lot of what has been discussed we've already talked about but I'll try and be brief on the first one for traffic um, current and future. There's been a lot of feedback has come about the speed, and one of the things, uh, questions that came up, have they looked at the timing of the lights and how that impacts the speed on Indian bottles? Um, also, there was a comment that um, as a pedestrian, they f um, it is felt that it is less safe walking now with two lanes. It's gotten worse than when it was three lanes, and has there been proper consideration for pedestrian safety in the study, um, as well as with car. Did I capture that? Yeah, okay. Uh, with increased neighborhood conductivity and uh, non-motorized um, mobility, um, a lot of this, is there a way to reroute the um, arterial traffic to reduce the amount of traffic, like truck safety, but one of the main things we talked about um, was pedestrian crossing islands. Has there been any consideration given for pedestrian crossing islands? Is there a way that we can redesign with, you know, we've talked about having pedestrian buttons, but could there be a pedestrian cross island? Um, as well as it's been also mentioned before about the wheel, how are we looking at um, mobility of the future, like uh, segways along with the wheelchairs and Omegos and as far as neighborhood conductivity with the way our um, streets are set up today with Indians in bottles, is there a psychological feeling of separateness due to the roads as they exist today? And then um, with the economic development, um, we talked about, and I think this was already mentioned too, about a redesign of Indian in bottles. Could it be? Uh, similar to Ellsworth and Larkin, and again, that addresses the Business 10 drunk trunk line issue, and that probably can't be changed, but maybe there is a way to look at how traffic flows. And also, we did have some discussion, which is already, I think, mentioned at the prior table, about gentrification 
and a criteria is there criteria for mixed income housing and how do we accommodate mixed retail at various rent price points thank you okay uh, I am uh, another David Kepler uh, and I'm representing table eight so for again most of our comments have been said but for traffic and safety a couple items that are either worth emphasizing or are new was that we talked about um, really this road diet um, has value but it would be, it would be one of, at least one opinion at the table was finding a diversion and building up a diversion route for for large state traffic would be uh, the real ideal um, all the other things that were commented on to make it safer are good but it would be great if we could move things away um, uh, <coughs> For traffic and safety, we also had that um, uh, it's worth noting that this original design was for the size of Dow Chemical at the time versus the way it's being used now with the shift change of factory work and that we don't have the same issues we had with that kind of traffic that we did when it was created and uh, that the population of Midland has really remained the same. Uh, we're still right, right around 41 and at the same time, the future generations are using cars less and less in, at the pre preference of driving more and more. Uh, using cars less at the, at the preference of walking and using other means of, of non-motorized transportation more, so the needs should continue to go down um, as things stay kind of the way they are. Uh, also, nope, nope, that was. So for non-motorized mobility and connectivity, uh, it's important to recognize that a lot of cities have had great success with increasing um, the ability to move around in the uh, in their downtown areas and throughout their cities with non-motorized traffic, and that this supports that. Um, three lanes to cross is uncomfortable. I know there's been a lot of anecdotal evidence on both sides. Um, people have said that three lanes makes them feel l uh, less safe to cross, and some people have said two lanes makes them less safe to cross. Um, I think that only time can kind of tell as we continue to look at the whole study um, because in the end, there's data is the most transparent thing. So we get the whole study, look at all the data, and then we can make a more informed choice on how these things are actually playing out. Um, continued growth of the downtown is going to require that people feel like they can get where they want to go. Um, and right now, we cut off, you know, we have Midtown as the neighbor to downtown, and the best move for a midtown person to get to downtown is still to drive. And so we talk about traffic, we talk about, we talk about traffic and that's part of it. If they're walking, there would be few, less traffic playing around in that area, but also uh, less parking needs if more of those people felt like they could just walk over instead of driving. So it, it might uh, help you several problems. Um, so yeah. for economic, economic development, and context sensitive design. Uh, we agree with many people, more food, uh, more music, uh, live music options, um, continue to, develop, to, to, to make it uh, attractive for development. Um, one, I, one thought was that other cities are doing at kind of the next stage of this process is when there are, where there are streets that are not heavily used, not talking about Indian and Bottles, but some of the other cross streets, um, actually taking one or two of them and closing them down, turning them into walk only streets um, cobblestone streets where you would get to have all the um, non-motorized traffic everywhere. We have lots of, of one-ways and, and smaller streets in the downtown area. It's possible something could be done with that to increase that opportunity. Um, okay, that's all, that's all our comments. Thank you. Um, when this first yeah. began, the guy said it, it's all about safety. Oops, sir, I need you to use the microphone, if you would, please. Well, Thank you. safety isn't an increase of 42% in more accidents. And 
if they put in the sprite lane, it's going to be a big eyesore because you're gonna have, they're going to have to put concrete barriers to help them not be run over by trucks. I mean, quit kidding yourself that you actually like these bicycle people and put them on a road where there isn't any traffic like Ellensburg. And Midland is growing. All these other road diets are putting in towns that are decreasing in size. And if we just turn this town into one big bottleneck like you guys want to with really s slow speeds, why not put in speed bumps too? I mean, you can do that. It's your town. But the rest of the world would like you to be in your own dysfunction. And we'll take a bypass around Midland because Midland's just another town between Mount Pleasant and Bay City. I mean, you can stroke your egos with a whole bunch of you know, beautification, but when you want businesses to come here and deliver, they don't need time delays. They don't need employees being stuck in traffic all day just so you can make some beautification project beautiful. I mean, People are hurting every day, getting in accidents because of this experiment that's accomplishing an agenda that wants to move everybody out of their cars and onto bicycles, like Nixon time, 1973. That's a bicycle-centric economy, and that's what you're trying to push us into. And you're totally clueless if you don't see it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Phil Dubois uh, over on Montrose Street. Lived in the downtown area all my life. Uh, worked downtown also. Our table consensus most everybody has talked about. Um, so I won't won't go over a lot of those subjects, but uh, basically uh, Where is the the traffic flow that we're talking about the safety issues east to west? Uh, that traffic flow, you know for the most part uh, You know people go into the Mount Pleasant trucks delivering so on and so forth through traffic so the safety concern is the crosswalks and it's already been talked about Redo the crosswalks. I mentioned to the table, <coughs> I happened to va uh, vacation in Vegas. They know how to move people. Not talking the big overpasses, not talking the tunnels underneath, but they have state-of-the-art, well-lit crosswalks. Stop traffic, lit strobe lights, and already been talked about, improve the ones we already have, add more at the side streets, for the smaller streets, push button activated. Um, and like I said, everything else has been talked about. The uh, support of economic development. Um, you know, shops people want, specialty shops. You know, we have to admit people shop Amazon. I mentioned the malls killed downtown. Amazon has killed the malls. Uh, specialty items that people can't find, uh, uh, you know, the quaint little shops and the support from the people. I go on Midland then and now. They were just talking about Hamilton's pastry shop. Everybody loved it. Great. Oh, had the best donuts. But yet they went out of business. Myers, Walmart, bakery, cheaper, more convenient. Don't know, but everybody talks about what we had what we lost, but why did we lose it? You got to go there. You got to walk that extra block. You know, parking, yes, parking's a problem everywhere. Parking downtown, parking at the malls. We used to all jam pack in the malls at Christmas, walk 10 miles, it seemed like, during the whole day. And now we're talking about, oh, parking downtown, I got to walk two blocks to get to this store. I can't park right in front of the store, you know. Support your local businesses. 
That's the big thing. Anybody that puts a shop in downtown, support them. Go down there. You got to cross traffic, you know, good in, good crosswalks. That's all. That's all. Thank you. Okay, we've heard a lot of comments tonight. Some frank, frankly, more comments than we thought we would would hear, and we um, appreciate the time that um, you took to give those to us. So I need to be honest with you in that um, we have a responsibility to be out of this building by 9.30. So with that said, um, with that said, I wish I had a great idea on what to do, um, <laughs> but... Um, How many people are for this road dive? How many people are against this road dive? What? We can't hear you. are against the road dive. Ask. You got the microphone. Ask. Okay. How many people are for the road diet? Is the camera getting that? Okay, how many people are against the road diet? Okay, how many people don't know what they think about it? Okay. And then the next question, what, Mayor, is who from the city introduced this idea to MDOT? I think that's a question that needs to be answered. Okay, so I've heard, how did this question start? <laughs> Who from the city introduced this idea, Brad? Was the interview I read about Mike Hayes having a sidebar with MDOT, was that the starting of this? We can't hear back here. So the question was, was there a sidebar with someone that that got us to this point. So if I go back and look at 2016. 15. 15. Okay, so we'll go to the frequently asked questions. Where is that? How was this road um, quarter study initiated? So under frequently asked questions, there it is right there. The road diet itself? You guys didn't look out your window at the county building and go, geez, I think we could take a lane out of here. Someone approached, and it was in an interview that Mike Hayes did, so it's, I mean, it's not a secret, that he, on Eastman Road, when he worked for the Center for the Arts, that he had a sidebar, exact word used, with MDOT about fixing these roads. If that's really the truth, just come out and say, yeah, that's how it started. You know, that's what people want here. They want transparency of this board and of the people behind it. And you may get half of the people here to say, you know what, this is a good idea. But until the honesty comes out, people are so distrusting. Zero trust. So that's all people are asking for from you. And I think Brad Kay knows the answer to that question.
So for those of you that couldn't hear, here, the question again was, where did this all start? And you've heard the answers tonight. You've heard MDOT presentations. You've heard staff presentations from the city. There are two, two initiatives. The first is the MDOT road study itself, and that is the entire corridor. That was a study that was initiated by MDOT. It was initiated in partnership in the sense that MDOT came to the city. We were stakeholders in that. We indicated, amongst others, these were the types of criteria that were important to the city. That was the initiation of the study. The study itself was produced and completed. It was presented to city council. In that report that was presented to city council were the three options which Grant indicated in his presentation. The result of the presentation to city council was the initiation in principle um, of, the, of the study that we're underway right now. MDOT presented to city council the fact that there would need to be a study done in order to test the validity of the recommendations that were included in the report. And that's what council has supported at this point in time. There are not, there have not been decisions made. Um, the mayor indicated there's not decisions tonight. There will continue to be opportunities for input at future times. But the idea right now is can we even do this? There's nothing more to it than that. I answered the question. I understand that you would like somebody else to have been. Let me finish, please. I understand that you are insinuating that there is another party that was involved. I am telling you from city council's perspective, this is what we know to be the truth. Now, if there were conversations beyond that, I couldn't say because I was not part of them. I'm not aware of them. I only know what has been presented to city council and what was presented to these members of council. Jocelyn, where is Bill Mayhew tonight? Yeah, another, uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, prior obligation. That's what I did. And so did Jim, right? Sorry? So did Jim. Michael? Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. So which person from MDOT came to you guys? Okay, just a moment, please. So you're, you're, you're acting like we have memos that go back and forth. We actually meet with the city all the time. We talk about MDOT roads. We talk about construction. And I can't tell you the person who actually mentioned in the meeting who said yes and who didn't, because we we're always working together. I, we're, that's really what happens. So um, we just, there is no, what do, we, we meet and we present. I'm sorry, what was that? Okay, ladies and gentlemen. We've answered the question the best we can. And I have to agree with the gentleman from MDOT. We talk all the time. I don't know that anyone writes down who said what first. And I believe everyone sitting in this room, no matter what side you are on this particular issue, want the best for our community, and that, is our, and that is our true belief, and I do not believe that there is any huge conspiracy out there that needs to be affirmed one way or the other. I believe we're working for what is very best for Midland. So with that said, it is 9.30. We'd like it if you would please leave all of your papers on the table so we can gather that information. And we thank you for taking the time to be here this evening. <laughs>